caring about the neighbor in need and being willing to identify with the oppressed, not standing with the oppressor. Most of us don't want to be called a follower. Most of us don't want to be called a follower at all. Corporations and congregations alike look for leadership quality. Young people aspire to be leaders. Obituaries usually draw attention to the leadership qualities of the deceased. We value strong leaders in government, in community, in Christian church. We do not usually seek followers. Which brings me to a really delightful story. It's about a young man applying for admissions at a prestigious college. It only admits 250 students per class. The boy's parents got a questionnaire to fill out in which, among other questions, was this one. Is your son or daughter a leader or a follower? The parents pondered that question for quite some time, and they concluded that while their son was a very able student, he was probably more of a follower than a leader. This is what they indicated on the form in due time. They received a letter from the college admissions office. And it said their son had been accepted with a notation added, we are pleased that in a class of 249 leaders, we will have one follower. It is doubtful that any of Jesus' disciples saw themselves as leaders. Jesus never asked them to be, but called them to be a faithful follower. Jesus himself was the leader, and they were asked to believe in him and follow him in the Christian church. We need uh, fewer people who perceive themselves as leaders, movers, and shakers, and many more of them are people who are willing to be followers. Because it's impossible, it is impossible to be a true leader in the Christian church without being a follower of Jesus Christ. Let me say that again. It is difficult, if not impossible, to be a true leader in Christian church without being a follower of Christ Jesus. In our gospel this morning, Mark writes of a man of faith who came to Jesus, knelt before him, and saw Jesus out as one of the one who taught the way of salvation. He says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Theologically, we might have wished Jesus had answered him, simply believe and you will have eternal life. But that's not what he does. He doesn't make it so easy for this man. He says, keep God's laws. Which the guy said, I, I have, I have, I've kept all of them. Free your life from bondage to money and possessions. But it's so easy. To inherit eternal life calls for obedience. Jesus says to this man, you know the commandments. You shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. The law of God is the foundation for obedience. Being a follower of Jesus means knowing God's will. God's will is based on the Ten Commandments. Following the commandments leads to a happy and a God-pleasing life. But there is more to being a follower than just being a, Jesus, a follower of Jesus than just living a moral life. The man replied that he had kept all the commandments from his youth. Jesus' response is wonderful. He looked at him, and it doesn't say he looked at him and said. Did anybody catch what it says? He looked at him and loved him. That's a really weird thing to, for Jesus to say, for, for the scripture to say. Jesus looked at him and said, versus Jesus looked at him and loved him. Now, how this censured, uh, sentence is structured is found only in the Gospel of Mark. In Matthew's account, the one who came to Jesus is called a young man. In Luke's, it is called a ruler. Here we are given an age or told his social position. When the man is called the rich young ruler, it is a conflation of the three Gospels. 
but only Mark describes Jesus' reaction to this man who had struggled to keep the commandments as a faithful follower of God since his youth. That attitude is love. God loves those who seek after him, that seek after him to follow him in obedience. But this man lacked one thing. This man lacked one thing. Jesus said to him, sell what you own and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. When the man heard this, he was shocked. Shocked and went away grieving. Or as it used, uh, as it used to be translated, his countenance fell for he had many possessions. Now a little history lesson. The earliest name for the Christians before the term Christian was coined was, quote, people of the way. People of the way. It suggested that we are on a journey through life and that we can walk with God or not. We can follow Jesus or we can follow our own path through life. God wants us to be law-abiding and upright. The Ten Commandments are a good guide, but even in the culture with script, without scriptures, God's law is written in the hearts of the people. Remember it says, my law is written on their hearts. They know that they should not steal, lie, commit murder, commit adultery. To be happy means not to be consumed with envy for others or covet what we, have, what we do not have. We know this, but Christianity is more than a moral philosophy. It means people who are willing to follow Jesus to the cross and people that are not only willing to follow Jesus to the cross, but also to follow Jesus and suffer. The way to the cross is the way to the crown of eternal life. And Jesus in our gospel is clear about what that cross just may be for people in the richest countries of the world, like the United States. When people have more than enough of material goods, the way of obedience is to share with those who do not have enough. Jesus' answer to the man is very clear. Sell what you have and give it to the poor. That is the way to have treasure in heaven. The saying was so hard that the hearer left in shock. He left dismayed. Sure, he was able to keep the Ten Commandments, but he was unwilling to give up his money and give up his power. Jesus then remarked to his disciples, how hard will it be for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? Nothing. Nothing should come between us and God's kingdom. It is God's good and gracious will that we receive our daily bread. Everything we need for abundant life. Food, clothing, home, shelter, work, family, friends, and yes, even the setup of our government. Heaven is described in the Bible as a banquet feast and life with God here and now. It can be characterized as blessing upon blessing upon blessing. But Jesus says, it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for the rich to enter heaven. He is not saying that material blessings are wrong, but that they are rather God's gift to share with those in need. Those who have been richly blessed should use those resources to bless others. You know, when I was growing up, we would sometimes buy frozen pizza at Cassidy Superstore. The name of the brand was Totino's. Anybody remember Totino's pizzas? Anybody? Totino's. The Totino family started a restaurant in Minneapolis in the 1950s, which specialized in Italian food. Their pizza was so well received that in 1962, they entered the wholesale pizza business. In a few years, the business had survived difficult times and began to develop a nationwide reputation for excellence. Then it was purchased by Pillsbury for $20.3 million. 
and Mrs. Totino became the first woman vice president of Pillsbury. Financial worries were over for the Totinos. They had become independently wealthy. But the story does not end there. On the day the sale was complete, Mrs. Totino gave $2 million, $2 million to Northwestern College in St. Paul, a small, small Bible-centered college in St. Paul. In gratitude for its, she gave it in gratitude for its radio ministry, which she had changed, which had changed her life. Her husband, a Roman Catholic, gave two million to the Catholic schools of the Twin Cities out of gratitude for his moral and religious training. They had received much and were willing to give back so much. I'd like to share with you a true story. A story about a woman from a Lutheran pastor's first parish. Her name was Pearl. She was a retired Chicago teacher, not a wealthy person. In fact, she had gone back to school as a young uh, widow with two boys to raise uh, because she needed to support them. In her retirement, she sold her home, a small Chicago bungalow, and moved into an apartment. She did not know what the future would bring for her or what her needs were going to be. But in faith, she decided to give a tithe from the sale of her home to God's work. She also decided to give $10,000 to the foreign missions of the Lutheran Church and furnished a prayer chapel in the congregation. From what she had been given, she was willing to give a return to the Lord. Jesus is clear that the way to eternal life is obedience. Those to whom much has been given, of much is expected. Those to which much has been given, of much is expected. Stewardship, discipleship, means giving money, time, energy, and ability to the Lord. It means taking a stand on moral and religious issues. It means caring about the neighbor in need and being willing to identify with the oppressed, not standing with the oppressor. Identifying with the oppressed, not standing with the oppressor. Yes, the world prefers the rich young ruler for, the, for his attributes. We respect money and power and we find the young attractive. Most congregations and organizations and communities would be delighted to welcome this man who came to Jesus. He had many gifts to be a leader in the community. Far better educated than the Galilean fishermen who were following Jesus. More acceptable and more upstanding than the publicans and the tax collectors who had become disciples. And Jesus did not want a leader. What did he want? It starts with an F. He wanted a follower. And he wants us to follow too. Jesus does not need people who have all the answers who know everything, those who are complacent that they have done everything they need to do, but rather those who are willing to seek answers, to share resources, to take risks for their faith. These people may seem to be leaders, but in actuality, they are followers. To be a follower means to know, digest, and live the truth that Jesus Christ is the only only true leader. The one who reveals God's will and speaks God's word. Following Jesus will be hard. Keeping the commandments, giving back a portion of what God has blessed you with, recognizing all that we have is a gift from God and is to be used to God's glory. We are not asked to be leaders. We are invited to become a follower of the King of kings and the Lord of lords, our Lord and our Savior. I'm going to go on a little side trip here. Follow with me. When I was down in South Florida, I did a lot of serving meals to homeless. And I became amazed 
at how entitled they felt they were. I became amazed that 95% of those people who are homeless want to be homeless. They want to receive their government check. They want to get their free meals. They want this and that. And, and I remember there's one guy who would come to the gates, the front gate of our church every, every uh, week or so, and we would hand out bag lunches. And I remember then there was a bottle, and he always said, I can't drink this kind of water. He preferred to have a different kind of water. And I can't have this kind of peaches. I want Del Monte peaches. And, and it was so forth and so on, just like that. Why am I telling you this? Many times the people who we see as being homeless are not the poor. The poor that we need to really focus on is the family where the parents both are working two jobs, maybe, maybe three, to make ends meet, to try to figure out how to put food on their tables. The, the poor are those people who are taking advantage of the fact that you can turn around on every block and find a job to work, and they're taking advantage of it and, and working their hind ends off to feed their family, to, scoop, to put clothes on their kids' backs. Yes, there are homeless who are, who are there because of situations. No, I'm not saying all the homeless, we shouldn't do anything for them, but I am saying... When we talk about giving to the poor, please, please, please pay attention to who you are giving it to and why you are giving it to them and why they are in the situation they are. Ours is not to judge, but ours is to discern. I just was so, so amazed. And in a day like today, when jobs are so abundant, there really should not be many who are unemployed. I just thought about that the other day as I was driving by Owen Park. There's a lot of work out there for people. And it reminded me of Florida, how so many people were, were, were homeless because they chose to. They wanted to collect their check. They wanted to live off the grid. They didn't want to have to respond or be responsible to anybody. That, my friends, is not necessarily the poor. When we talk about giving to the poor, be aware of who you're giving to. Because there are many out there who are sharks who will take, you're Christian? I need, I need my, I remember there was, I'm going, I'm sorry. There was one telephone number that I kept getting a, a, a phone call from every other week. Rice Lake phone number, by the way. My mom, is, my mom is really bad. My mom is near death. She's only got a couple days to live, and I've got four children to raise, and we're living out of a hotel room. And it was the same story week in and week out. Until one day I said, oh, by the way, how's your mom? Oh, well, she's doing really well. She's... And I said, I thought she was near death. Click. It's always the same. Pastor's phone rings. Pastor, pastor, I need money. I need money. Well, what if I give you a, a, some food from our, from our food bank? No, no, I need money. Just be aware. When people are asking for things, be aware of who they are, why they're asking, because there are so many out there who want to take advantage. I know that was a sidebar from, from, our, from, our, um, from my message, but yet it ties in. Give to the poor. Give to those in need. Not necessarily those who feel entitled. Amen.